Okay. And also we have here our dearest chancellor, uh, Ma'am uh, Cora Abansi, and uh, the Dean of the College of Social Sciences, uh, Dean uh, Leia Abayao. And uh, yeah, it's nice to have uh, this pool of scholars and academicians who will be giving us uh, lectures about Baguio City on sustainable development and also uh, Baguio City as a creative uh, and uh, cultural uh, city. So um, again, I would like to thank everyone for spending your time uh, today with us as we have our, as we have this uh, webinar. So uh, before we get started, I'd like to go over a few items about this uh, today's event. By the way, my name is Joao Paolo. I'm a uh, faculty member of the Department of History and Philosophy here at the University of the Philippines, Baguio. So why do we have this event? Uh, the College of Social Sciences in cooperation with the College of Science uh, is hosting the 113th Baguio Charter Day, an anniversary lecture series. And this lecture series serves as an avenue for our scholars, researchers, and other enthusiasts uh, to disseminate or engage okay, in the recent works uh, about the city of Baguio. And this lecture series, uh, which happens today shall be divided into two panels. So the morning panel, which is uh, from 9 a.m. to 12 noon, will cover topics related to Baguio as a sustainable city, while the afternoon session, which is 1 p.m. to 4 p.m., shall cover works on Baguio as a heritage city. So as I mentioned earlier, we have speakers here from different disciplines, and they will be enriching our knowledge uh, about Baguio and the future of Baguio as uh, a sustainable and heritage uh, city. So we are also joined by uh, the city government, especially the city planning and development office of Baguio City, uh, which is represented by our speaker later, architect Don Atabaki. So uh, as we uh, continue on, uh, let us hear a message an, uh, an opening remark from our dear Chancellor, uh, Chancellor Corazon Abansi, ma'am. Okay, so thank you, Joao, uh, to our colleagues in the University of the Philippines, to our guests from the city government of Baguio, and to our visitors who are joining us in today's webinar. A pleasant morning to you all. Last week, Baguio commemorated two historical events, the 113th Charter Day of the City, and the 77th end of the Second World War in the Philippines. It is in the spirit of celebration and commemoration of these events that the College of Social Sciences, together with the College of Science of UT Baguio, is hosting this 113th Baguio Day Anniversary Lecture Series. The Baguio Day Anniversary Lecture Series serves as an avenue for our scholars and other researchers to share with the public their recent researches about the city of Baguio. It is an opportunity for an open dialogue between the academe and the public to enrich both research and discourse. Last year, the focus of the presentations delivered was on the rich history that Baguio had from its colonial genesis to its post-colonial transformation. This year, the anniversary lecture series has expanded its scope to include the contemporary issues confronting the city of Baguio. Our morning panel will focus on the question of Baguio City sustainability, beginning with Dr. Alejandro Ciencia's lecture on Baguio as a resilient city, followed by Dr. Rizel Balmores Paulina's presentation of her findings on a recent survey she has conducted about the city residents' perception on crime and safety. Another immediate concern that we are facing today is the increase in COVID variants. So Dr. Isabel Adawa's lecture will touch on this, specifically on the COVID-19 variants of concern in Baguio. Finally, Dr. Sinaida Bawanan will share her lecture on the condition of the remaining green spaces of Baguio. From examining Baguio's sustainability challenge, 
Our afternoon panel will provide a reflection on the rich heritage that Baguio has. Beyond the historical, Dr. Aris Reginaldo's lecture shall present the other natural heritage the city possesses in the form of its fine forest fragments and wildlife. Ms. Vernalisa Bautista's discussion, on the other hand, shall try to bridge the gap between culture and how it may contribute to the sustainability of the city. Lastly, our guest speaker, architect Donna Tabangi of the city government of Baguio, shall share with us the recent findings of the city government, cultural mapping team about the different tangible and intangible heritage assets of Baguio. Taken as a whole, this Baguio Day anniversary lecture series shall contribute to the growing body of knowledge and re relevant policies regarding the city's urban development. Coincidentally, this lecture will also hopefully support and enrich the efforts of the city of Baguio as it reflects on its past to better understand what Baguio is at the present and for its planning of a better future. Again, thank you for joining us and a pleasant day to everyone. Thank you very much, Chancellor. And yes, uh, I would agree to uh, Chancellor's statement earlier that last year's topic is more on the historical side of uh, Baguio City, uh, the development of Baguio as a multi-ethnic uh, city and also the construction of buildings, roads, and etc. But for this uh, anniversary lecture, we will be focusing on uh, the present and also how this will contribute to the future, the pathway of Baguio City as a sustainable and creative city. So uh, before we start uh, with our first uh, lecture for this morning, I just want to remind everyone uh, with regards to some uh, protocols or uh, guidelines for our participants. Uh, first, uh, may I ask you to please mute yourself or stop uh, your webcam. Uh, to mute yourself, just click the microphone icon in the bottom left uh, corner of the Zoom meeting. And to unmute, uh, click the microphone icon uh, again later if you are going to ask questions during our uh, Q&A portion. At the same time, uh, we would like to uh, ask you to prepare questions, okay? Uh, so that later we will be having a, a, a thorough discussion on uh, these topics that we have uh, for this event. And then uh, thirdly, we highly encourage that we uh, listen and participate and uh, yeah, enrich ourselves with regards to uh, Baguio City as a sustainable and creative city. So without further ado, I would like to introduce our first speaker. So. Our first speaker, speaker will be tackling Baguio as a resilient city. So uh, our speaker is Professor Alejandro N. Ciencia. He is a professor of political science at the Department of Economics and Political Science, College of Social Sciences, University of the Philippines, Baguio. He teaches research methods, political philosophy, and Philippine politics. And his research interests include urban resilience, water security, judicial decision-making and politics, and also issues of justice. So to present his uh, work to us, may I uh, hand this over to Professor Ali Siencia. Sir Ali. Good morning, Naimbag, nga bigat tayo amin. So we celebrate this month, the 113th year of Baguio as a city. The city has survived um, a world war, a major earthquake, periodic typhoons, seasonal monsoons, landslides and flooding, water shortages, then brownouts, and problems associated with urban growth. We are currently still in the midst of a pandemic. So one can ask, will Baguio still be in existence for another 113 years. The title of this presentation is Baguio as a Resilient City. Okay. 
Okay. Resilience has been defined in a variety of ways. Okay. For many, resilience simply refers to the ability to bounce back, to bounce back after a setback, after a disaster, to bounce back after shocks. But the very idea of resilience involves flexibility on the one hand and the ability to adapt or adjust to um, a new situation. Now, for this presentation, I, I chose to use or to utilize the de definition of resilience offered by the OECD or the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. Okay, for the OECD, resilience is the ability to absorb, recover, and prepare for future shocks. Now, for the OECD, resilience actually has four dimensions. There is the economic dimension, the social dimension, um, environmental dimension and institutional or governance dimension. For this presentation, I will focus on the environmental dimension. Now, these dimensions um, refer or involve the idea of some minimum requirements that make resilience or bouncing back possible. Now, what does this mean? Okay. So we can look at the environment of Baguio, look at Baguio's environment. Okay? We can look at the natural environment or, and at the same time, we can also look up, look up the, look at the built up or man-made environment and ask whether we have the basic requirements, the minimum requirements for Baguio to persist as a city, okay? So the key questions for this presentation are, number one, okay. can Baguio be described as a resilient city? In terms of its ability, in terms of the ability of its environment to provide its residents the most vital resource, potable water, at present and in the foreseeable future. So, your focus on paper co is um, potable water. Now, at the same time, you can ask: Can Baguio be described as a resilient city in terms of possessing the minimum infrastructure? that would make possible an adequate response to disasters and emergency situations. Now, so um, this, I actually did the research prior to the pandemic. So that time in the ISIPCO, and the most vital resource, water. We need water to survive. But I think after the pandemic, the pandemic brought to us the idea that apart from water, we also need air, quality air for people to survive. In any case, okay, um, I, I utilize materials for this um, presentation. I utilize materials that are available and released by uh, governmental agencies, but ba Baguio Water District, Philippine Statistics Authority, lo local government um, unit of Baguio. So as you will find, I, I relied on the CLUP or the Com Comprehensive Land, Land Use Plan of UP. Of, of, of Baguio, the Comprehensive Development Plan of Baguio. And at the same time, I also looked at um, materials produced by other researchers, whether these are UP Baguio based or non UP Baguio experts. Paso kasama dito yung mga works ni um, like architect Tabangin. At kasama din, of course, yung ano, mga interest nila, ng doc, nila doctors yung Naida Bawanan. Okay. Now, the aim of the presentation is to draw attention to the urgency of building resilience. Okay? At the same time, I want to draw attention to the need to build a shared database that will aid policymakers, planners, scholars, academics okay, in measuring and assessing Baguio's level of resilience in the coming years. Now, we need this data so that we can better prepare for disasters, stresses, shocks, and disruptions that we can expect to happen in the coming years. Now, so ang unang titignan natin, okay, if this is not the presentation of my um, findings. Ang unang titignan natin when, you, when it comes to the environment is, okay, the comparison between the built-up environment, okay, or man-made environment, and yung natural environment. Now, I will not delve into the details of this um, of this section because in the presentation Dr. Jenny Bawanan. But okay, we have a number of studies which show 
that we have an expanding built up environment and at the same time okay, a shrinking green shrinking environment here in Baguio City. So you have here pictures 1988, 1998, 2009. Mapapansin nyo, okay, kumukonte yung green spaces natin at lumalaki yung um, built up spaces. Now as to what exactly is the size, okay, there's actually um, debate, merong conflicting data. Now some, but, but some, what is obvious is that okay, the green areas are shrinking but as to the actual size of the remaining green areas i think you will find in the in the documents some conflicting findings and i hope this will be clarified later on pero okay the main idea here is that for a city to be resilient there must be more green spaces because we green spaces provide the resources that are essential to survival okay now so at the same time I want to look at, I wanted us to look at yung water resources or the available water that is available, the water that is available to residents of Baguio. Now, this is data provided by the Baguio Water District, see General Manager um, Royeka. And the data from 2013 to 2022 is that, okay, the last column, there is okay, an ever increasing shortfall. In other words, um, lumalaki yung population natin, there is increasing water demand, but the capacity of the city to provide for the needed water, the quantity of water needed, has been declining. Okay, so tumataas yung demand, mababa naman yung ating ano, um, water supply. Now, this is from the CLUP of the local, of Baguio City Local Government. Okay, so if you look at the it all those 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 areas with colors they represent you um the watershed now for a for a city to be resilient the ideal is that you have more um watersheds than the actual in relation to the total land area okay now this is now a data generated by our study a group of um faculty members and researchers from the College of Social Sciences, Department of Economics and Political Science, okay, conducted a survey in um, 2015. Ang lumabasa survey is that 89.2% of households in Baguio City rely on water refilling stations for their water. Now, why is this significant? When we talk of water supply, and okay, water security and the satisfaction of water needs. We are not simply interested in the quantity of water which is available. We are, we are also interested in the quality of water which is available. Now, what the finding here is that 89.2% of residents of households do not, do not rely on, body water, on the body water district for their drinking or potable water, okay? It may be psychological, it may be just the, the thinking that people have been accustomed to the idea that the Baguio Water District water is not clean or potable, so therefore they rely on water refilling stations. But the point here is that if we want to maintain resilience in the city, we have to ensure that people have access to potable water. Okay. The, this reliance on water refilling stations is a resilient or adaptive behavior of residents. Okay. But again, the, the idea is, okay, on the one hand, people are resilient, they're adapting the situation. But on the other hand, it would be a lot better if we can have water, which is a lot cheaper because Baguio Water District water is a lot cheaper and, and available to all. So there's not only the question of quantity, there's also the question of uh, quality, there's also the question of affordability. A more resilient city is a city with affordable water. Now, at the same time, I want us to look at it, uh, um, the wastewater treatment. Okay? If we, a city that is resilient must have an efficient and a working sewerage system. The 2015 UP Baguio survey showed that only 22.2% of households are connected to the city's sewerage system. And these are households that are located near the central business district. Okay. So 68.4, almost 70% of households in the city are not connected to 
access to the range system. Now, so at, at the same time, okay, we okay, we need a we need more treatment plants in the city. The Baguio Sewage Sit Treatment Plant receives an average of 10,002 cubic meters of wastewater per day. But this is more than the what the treatment plant is capable of um, filtering or cleaning. Okay. Now, I also want to draw attention to the issue of um, to the possible threat of over extraction and water contamination. Okay, we have depleting water sources, but at the same time, maybe this is a an adaptive behavior of um, Baguio residents. But what we can find here is that there are there's an increasing number of um, deep wells being constructed by citizens, residents in Baguio. The red marks here represent the private deep wells. The blue marks represent the Baguio water district. Um, now, this needs to be regulated if you want to ensure the quality and the, the quantity of water for Baguio residents. Okay, now I turn to the issue of um, the infrastructure for emergency response. So this is a map from the Baguio, Baguio city government. I think this is CLUP, land use plan. The yellow marks represent the number of evacuation centers. Now, what we find here is that in Baguio City, we have many designated evacuation centers. Most of these are public elementary schools. So, Medjo, this is a good sign, okay, for the city. This bodes well for the city, the fact that we have, okay, areas that can be repurposed. These are not really meant to be ev evacuation centers, but they can be repurposed as evacuation centers in the event of disasters or emergencies. But of course, it would be better if we really have, possibly, that we really have a designated, um, professionally designed evacuation centers. Now, I, I would like to draw attention to the fact that the local government um, department has certain requirements for uh, an ideal evacuation center. Okay. I will not discuss them in detail now, pero okay, like dapat merong um, areas in evacuation centers where um, mothers can breastfeed their children. There is this number of space, this proportion of area. Okay. At the same time, okay, in, re in relation to emergency response, we can look at number of hospitals and health centers in Baguio City. To some extent, and when we compare Baguio City to neighboring uh, municipalities, mas in Baguio City kasi ang dami nating hospitals, ang dami nating ano, um, health centers, marami tayong health professionals. So this bodes well for the city okay? compared to neighboring towns. And at the same time, um, if you look at Baguio City, Another positive um, trait of Baguio City is that we have a number of emergency response groups. In 2015, may ginawang um, workshop on Cordillera Study Center with um, emergency response groups. And sa bilang naman of participate, there were at least 13 groups. But I know that the actual group is a lot bigger. Now, this is good, a good. Um, indication, a good sign for, and this bodes well for Baguio's resilience. So, dami ng ating volunteer groups that are willing to help in the event of um, emergencies or disasters. Ang problema lang, ang one of the problems that I notice is that, of course, because these are in, independent or autonomous groups, there's always the problem of coordination. It would be better if, uh, if we have groups that can work together. Okay, so I will now summarize the findings of this presentation. Okay, the city's water infrastructure and emergency response infrastructures need to be enhanced to raise Baguio's level of resilience. The ever increasing water supply shortfall raises questions about the city's ability to provide its citizens with adequate, adequate quantities of the vital resource. And the city's level of resilience in terms of its emergency response capability seems to be higher than that of its neighbors, but it certainly stands to benefit from some major improvements. Maraming salamat, and that is my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Ali.
Thank you for that uh, valuable insights, which later on we will be uh, clarify some matters uh, with regards to your uh, research in our open, uh, question and open question and answer portion. So let's proceed immediately to the next uh, presenter. Uh, let me introduce uh, our next speaker. Wait a minute. So to talk about Baguio City as a safe space, okay, we have Professor Minute, okay. So we have Professor Russell Balmores Paulino uh, to talk about Baguio as a safe city, residents' perception on crime and safety. So our speaker is an associate professor in the Department of Anthropology, Sociology, and Psychology, College of Social Sciences, University of the Philippines, Baguio. She teaches psychology in the department and has been with the university since 1997. She has done research on women, and work, adolescent risk behaviors, and the psychology of Filipino humor. And using social psychology as lens, she is currently doing research on safety perception, COVID-19, and stigma. So to talk about uh, Baguio City's safety based on the perception of its citizen, uh, let's call on Professor uh, Balmores. A pleasant day to everyone. I'm happy to share with you the results of my study entitled Baguio as a Safe City, Residents' Perceptions on Crime and Safety. Right, so before that, let me first acknowledge uh, the support of the following. So this work was supported through a research load credit granted by the College of Social Sciences, University of the Philippines, Baguio. And at the same time, no, this was also made possible through the assistance of the following offices, the Baguio City Mayor's Office, the Barangay Affairs Office, and the Public Information Office of the City of Baguio. Right. So let me begin with a very basic concept on human needs. Uh, inherent in the landscape of human existence is the experience of vital needs. Uh, of course, there are various kinds of needs. Some needs are very basic. Some needs are um, necessary for human lives to, to flourish. Uh, but in any case, these needs are deemed potent enough to propel people to act in ways that will alleviate the tension created by the need and to reinstate balance. Right. So um, now, when we talk about needs, um, there are, of course, a number of needs, and we're all familiar with Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? So uh, what are we interested in this study? So we're particularly interested in the second level no, of this pyramid, the safety and security needs, right? Now for the safety and security needs, sometimes this is also referred to as deficiency needs. And it is defined as the human need to avoid threatening, dangerous, or unfamiliar, no? Uh, stimuli or objects. It remains to be a pervasive and powerful need throughout a person's lifespan and proves to be worthwhile when fulfilled. Right. So, you know, so it, uh, safety needs are one of our uh, very basic needs, but very potent as well. Right. To show you the importance of these needs, let me share with you a quote you now from William Jeffers. Okay. According to him, Safety applies with equal force to the individual, to the family, to the employer, to the state, the nation, and to international affairs. Safety in its widest sense concerns the happiness, contentment, and freedom of mankind. So um, it, it, this, this goes to show no, how safety, how safety needs are really very powerful and very crucial, of course. Right. Now from there, let's move on and see the connection of a very psychological need, which is safety need, to, um, to society. No? So this will lead us to the idea of um, urban safety. Safety has, one of the major, has been one of the major concerns in cities. A city, of course, can be defined in various ways. No? And at the same time, um, cities can operate differently 
no and um but um in any case even if that is the case no even if this is if cities are defined differently and they operate uh in different ways as well um what's pervasive here is that uh there is always the need to keep cities uh safe no it is it, it is the uh, pervasive concern um, as a result of um, urbanization, cities became the breeding ground of particular concerns and challenges, with, of course, reverberating impact on the residents' quality of life. So, um, also, at the same time, now, when we talk about cities, uh, there's this uh, some sort of uh, paradoxical nature of city life. Why? Because um, cities are burdened by problems, no? problems like pollution, criminality, uh, loneliness, but at the same time, no, cities are also places where job and leisure opportunities are higher. This is according to Novolati 2014. So therefore, it is crucial to strive towards keeping our cities our own haven uh, because of the benefits that come with it. Uh, at the same time, according to Raiden, safe homes and secure neighborhoods are among the factors that bring about a healthy city. So this leads us now to the concept of safe city, which is according to um, some literature, no? this was pioneered by Jane Jacobs, author of the book, The Death and Life of Great American Cities. And this is one of um, um, the interesting quotes no? from the book. Cities are by definition full of strangers. The bedrock, bedrock attribute of a successful city district is that a person must feel personally safe and secure. So, as early as 1960, you know, there's also this, there's already this concept of safe city, right? Um, and then later, you know, decades after, okay, um, the safe, safe city concept was emphasized by the UN Habitat Nations in 1996. So as you can see here in this quote, how is how important is safety? You no, know? it is so important that it has been. Uh, used as an indicator no, for development. No? So let me quote from the United Nations system-wide guidelines on safer cities and human settlements. Um, it says here, safety and security are key elements of the quality of life in urban centers from the perspective of sustainable social, cultural, economic development, civic vitality, and human rights. Without safety, there's no sustainable urban development. And without sustainable urban development, there is no safety, right? Now, of course, as people got interested in the idea of, in the concept of safe cities, um, um, countries aspire towards making their cities secure. Uh, there's also this important um, need to empirically assess safety. So this has become apparent, no? this need to, to assess safety in various cities in the world. And there is this uh, Safe Cities Index. No? Um, it began in 2015, and it is updated once, uh, one every two years. No? Uh, hence, meron ng 2017 and 2019 reports. Uh, these reports have gone through some revisions in terms of the indicators utilized in assessing safety of cities. Like, for example, yung 2021 Safe Cities Index, um, in integrate na dyan, no, yung impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. So just to give you an idea, you'll see here in this um, in this uh, slide, no, the uh, different domains, no, of the Safe Cities Index. So you have their five personal, infrastructure, health, digital, and environmental domains. And uh, you will see, no, kung igu Google niyo yung Safe Cities Index, you will see their the descriptions for each domain. So ito siya in summary, but I will not go into the details anymore. Right. Now maybe we are asking, bakit Baguio? Why Baguio as a safe city? No. Um, the desire to study Baguio and its safety was primarily propelled by a news report by Philippine Star. Uh, sometime in 2018, okay, and it was named, um, the city, Baguio City was named as one of the 10 safest cities in Southeast Asia, according to uh, a crowdsourced global database, okay. So, syempre, merong concern na uh, accurate ba yan, no? <clears throat> That's why this uh, study is aimed at validating, no, this particular claim, no, by particular, by looking at the perceptions of the residents, 
So this leads us now to a perception of safety, right? So uh, why perception of safety? Of course, maraming ways. Now, there are many ways by which we can um, assess safety yeah, and study uh, the safety of a particular place like Baguio, for instance. No? But um, it is recognized that safety and security can be understood using two dimensions, no? the actual and the perceived. So yung actual, yun yung actual risks, no? uh, it could be based on reports of um, the rate of crime and so on. No? But at the same time, there's also the perceived aspect of safety and security and why is it important to study perception of safety right safety perception um, is uh, based on the idea that uh, our safety perceptions have a strong influence on the quality of life safety perception is one way of viewing the safe city landscape it does not give the full picture of course of the phenomenon but it can determine how people will behave so if I may just uh, quote no, from one of the articles on why, why per the perception of safety is important, um, perception is the way a person thinks about or understands something. What the person perceives is what they see as real. And it is this perception of reality that shapes their behaviors. So ganun siya kahalaga, ganun kahalaga ang perception natin and safety perception in particular. Okay. Now let us uh, move on and uh, uh, try to uh, I'll try to share with you, you know, the results of the study. Okay, so um, this study is of course descriptive, uh, and um, the participants were se selected through purposive sampling. To qualify for the study, the participant must be at least 18 years old and must have resided in Baguio City for at least one year. Okay. So, um, and of course, ang isang requirement dahil online survey siya, uh, the participant must have an email account and access to the internet. Yan, no? So, just a glimpse of the, the result or the profile of the participants. No? So, this uh, study was, uh, uh, the results of this study were based on the data from 564 Baguio City residents. Okay, mas maraming females. At ang average age is 31.84 or 32 years old. Um, note, however, no, na uh, mas marami pa rin sa mga participants, uh, they belong to the younger generations, uh, meaning mas Gen um, Y and Z, kung gagamitan natin ng ganong categorization. No? Uh, and then, uh, I have more to say about their profile, but I'll just limit it to that. Okay? Um, and in terms of the objectives of the study, uh, I've tried to look into the following objectives. So the perception of crime and personal safety, their views about a safe place to live in, and their assessment of the current state of safety in Baguio City. Okay. So, um, and of course, since online siya, uh, participants were invited through social network, such as local Baguio-based FB pages, as well as through emails. Yeah, and, and this is where I sought the assistance of uh, the, Baguio, uh, the the Public Information Office, the Barangay Affairs Office, and of course, the Office of the City Mayor. And all right. So you will notice later as I present the results, merong quanti and may qualitative results. Right. So the first uh, slide, that I, or I mean the first table that I have here is on perceptions of the local community. Okay. Majority of the pers participants' perceptions about their local barang community, particularly their barangay, range from neutral to a positive response. So, in five out of six items here, no, half of the sample agreed that um, trust, dependability, cooperation, and accountability can be observed in their respective communities or barangays. In terms of issues, so I have here, of course, hindi exhaustive yung issues, but these are major issues in a community, no? And uh, according to the participants, um, they were asked to uh, select whether it is a major, a minor, or it's not a problem at all, no? A major problem, minor problem, or not a problem at all. And in general, results suggest that the issues enumerated here you know, were perceived by majority of the participants as minor problems or not a problem at all. Um, kung, pero kung susuriin, no, uh, the issues that were considered as sabihin na natin medyo relatively major compared to the rest, no, uh, ito yung mga uh, 
uh, yung, it would include the following items, noisy and, and or nuisance neighbors, teenagers hanging around in the street drinking, people in speeding cars, and noisy, rowdy, or inconsiderate behavior in the street. Yeah, okay. So, and then next table talks about avoidance of leaving the house during the day or night. No? Um, it is specifically in the, within this context, eh, when, I, when we ask this, when I ask this, no? um, whether they uh, felt worried about their home being broken into. No? And as a follow-up question to that, uh, there, there's this item, whether they will avoid leaving the house. No? And most of the responses were under never and sometimes. Okay? But of course, in general, mas maraming ayaw umalis ng bahay kapag uh, gabi. No? Okay. Right. <clears throat> so there. And then, um, now, in relation to, the, to their worry about crime, um, the participants would uh, were asked no? uh, about the responses. No? Kasi nga, worry about crime can propel them to engage in various responses, one of which would be target hard, hardening responses. And based on the result of this, uh, this I particular item, no, um, the percentage re percentages reveal that installing bars, security doors, gates, or fences were the top choices that the participants employed. Yeah, no? uh, however, if you'll also notice, no? Trimming bushes and shrub would come as the second action of choice. So, hindi naman sobrang uh, high-tech pa tayo, no? So, it's basic, no? Installing bars, doors, and then, of course, yung pag-trim ng mga bushes. Okay. Now, for pro-social responses, ito yung um, a response where, that requires seeking help from others. Ang target hardening response, by the way, is making a place more secure, Okay. There. So anyway, for pro-social responses, parang hindi tayo masyadong into it, no? Meaning, um, it's not a popular choice among the respondents at least. Um, uh, but, okay, it's also important to point out no, that among these options, discussing or solving the problem with neighbors as well as attending a place of worship, no? Obtained higher percentages than the other items. Now, the last um, category of possible responses to worry about crime is avoidance responses. And here, respondents no, uh, would engage in the following. So based on the results, ano yung pinaka-popular na choice? Walking with a companion, avoiding certain streets at night, and carrying some means of self-defense. No? Yan yung mga nakita nating top three avoidance responses employed by the participants. Now, aside from those items, we also try to assess their personal safety perception no? using a, a, this scale. No? The scale has three components, feeling safe, fear of crime, and safety confidence. Yeah, no? So you have there the definitions. Right, so anong lumabas sa results? Okay. In terms of, uh, I have here the mean scores. Okay. Uh, one to seven kasi ito, no? Okay, yung result, 1 to 7 with 7 being the highest. So in general, pag mas maha, mataas ang score, mas mataas din yung perception okay, for each of these indicators. And as you'll notice, as a whole, no, mataas ang feeling of safety dun sa tatlo. Okay? So these findings reveal that the respondent's perception of safety can be characterized by a moderate fear of crime a rather low safety confidence and a high feeling of safety. So, anong ibig sabihin nito? Participants perceive a moderate possibility of encountering threat or crime. They have low certainty in their ability to thwart the threat, but nonetheless, they seem to have a relatively high feeling of being safe. Yan. Now, I tried to... Uh, uh, try to break down no, the scores, no? According to sex, for instance, so males versus females. At ito naman yung lumabas na pattern. So here, you'll notice yung, um, uh, the results would show that uh, in terms of uh, the yung biological sex, no, yung female participants obtain higher mean scores for fear of crime. So mas mataas yung fear of crime ng women or female participants. Um, pero mas mataas din ang feeling of safety nila. 
So, that's something interesting. And then, for the male counterparts naman, they have a higher safety confidence compared to the females. Okay. Now, let's move on to... Um, I'll skip this slide. Let's move on to the quality part of the study. So, three important points lang naman, no? So, one is, what are the factors that make the participants feel safe? Right? So, in this study, it, ito yung lumabas, no? When it comes to the factors that make people safe, merong, we can cluster the themes in two types. One, external factors, no? Uh, including entities or people and the physical environment that make them feel safe. And then, meron din yung individual or internal factors or individual initiatives and resources. So, ano yung dominant na lumalabas sa sagot? Okay, so, um, the most dominant answer to this question is the prominence of the police force. Pag mas may noticeable presence ang police force, ang law enforcers, no, nagpo-provide siya ng, uh, ng ganung mas, mas assurance no, na safe yung area, free from danger or risks. Um, nandun din yung bukod sa mga kapulisan, no, yung presence din ng dependable, approachable barangay officials and tanod in creating a safe space for people. And then there's also yung quality ng neighborhood. No? So ito yung mga lumalabas na adjectives like decent, trustworthy, peaceful, and friendly yung, yung neighborhood. And on a personal level, no, lumalabas din yung uh, importance ng company of people like family, friends, uh, and even pets, no? particularly a pet dog, no? uh, in keeping the respondents feel like they are out of harm's way. Okay, so ano pa ba yung mga mahalaga sa external sources? Kasama din dyan yung uh, well-lit na streets, no? Okay, um, kasama din dyan yung, um, so aside from the lighting system, yung pagkakaroon ng mga personal security measures like secured locks and CCTV. Okay, and then in, when it comes to personal initiatives and resources, the participants feel safe when they are at home. Yeah, no? So I think logical naman yung reason na yun. But aside from that, meron din yung, they'd also like to learn self-defense skills and techniques, no? Uh, weapons for self-protection. And some respondents recognize their faith in God as their primary source of protection. Okay, now how about yung the other side of the coin? What do, uh, what factors make the participants feel unsafe, right? So, um, in this um, study, lumalabas, ito yung mga lumabas na mga findings, Diverse negative adjectives about people such as unruly, rude, um, rowdy, noisy, weird, no, seem to generate a fear response among the residents. However, the more common words associated with feeling with the feeling of being unsafe include individuals perceived as gangs or gang members, drunk, um, drug related, no, or drug addicts, dealers, no, uh, men. Lumabas din yun, uh, common, strangers, suspicious, and robbers. So, but as, aside from the presence of these entities, the absence of uniform personnel, like yung police patrol daw, can also create feelings of insecurity. Okay, so, um, also meron din lumalabas ng mga salient themes such as yung dark and crowded places as uh, factors that may trigger insecure feelings, no? Okay. So, yun. No? So, ganun din kasama rin yung pagmadilim. Ayan, dark and crowded places nga. No? So, kapag busted daw yung streetlights, nagtitrigger daw yun ng fear. Okay. Then, the last item in the results is yung tanong nga, no? Nung description nila ng Baguio, kung ito ba ay safe o hindi. So, in general, ang lumalabas is Baguio is generally safe, no? Um, but it has its flaws and it can still be improved, definitely. Ayan, no? So, uh, meron lang mga, ang mga common na lumalabas na nagtitrigger ngayon ng fear is yung halimbawa yung mga recent reports on missing persons, gang-related incidents, and aggressive tourists. Ayan, no? Although, kahit na ganun, meron ding mga responses na isang category ng theme is that Baguio is no longer safe, no? Ang context nito is they're trying to uh, compare this, no? Nung sa isang panahon na, 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 na witness nila, no? na mas safe ang Baguio noon. Okay? Right. What else? Okay. Um, another is, being able to walk around an area makes it a safe place. So, ito isa sa mga themes din na lumabas, no? To be, to freely walk around an area, no? Is perceived na, kumbaga, it's a behavioral indicator na safe ang isang lugar. Okay. And then, um, 
three more themes, no? So, the people make a safe place. So, kumbaga, um, yung, ras- yung responses kasi dito, describe yung Baguio people uh, in a positive light. Baguio folks are kind, friendly, honest, helpful, ganyan, no? So, mga pro-social actions. Right. And then, police visibility, lumabas ulit, makes a safer place. Yan, no? Lower probability of risk or endangerment. And dun yung association sa police visibility. And then, also, of course, again, street lights make people feel safe. Right. So, ngayon, so do, we ask the question again. So, is Baguio a safe city? So, in, in general, no, while it, it was recognized in the results, no, that the city has its share of imperfections and areas that can still be enhanced, Baguio City is viewed as, by and large, a safe place to live in. All right. So, thank you for listening, and I hope um, na inspire kayo, no, to uh, uh, still stay or still live here in Baguio City. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Palmores, for your presentation. Uh, I just want to remind everyone that uh, if you have questions and clarifications, you may just uh, post it on the chat box Q&A so that you won't forget your question as we listen to the next uh, presenters. So let's move on to our third uh, speaker. Okay, so uh, from resilient to safe city, now we're going to uh, talk about uh, COVID-19. So, yeah, si Mambrisa. So our next speaker will be uh, talking about uh, the variant of concern, which is COVID variant of concern uh, in the city of Baguio. Uh, professor Risavel Adawe is a professor of the Department of Mathematics and Computer Science in the College of Science at the University of the Philippines in Baguio. She is currently a recipient of the UP Scientific Productivity System for the Scientist One Award from 2020 to 2022 because of her continu- continued contribution to research and publications. She organized a voluntary research group for the exploratory data analysis of COVID-19 cases in Baguio City. She was awarded as one of the outstanding COVID-19 volunteer in the Cordillera region. And the UP system also recognized the efforts of Professor Adawe and her team when they were awarded the fourth Gawad Pangulo Award for Excellence in Public Service. So may I now uh, call on Professor Adawe? Ma'am Risa? Yes, hello, good morning. Yeah, may I share my slides? Thank you. Yes, ma'am, you may share po. Okay, so for a while, please. So I, I will be talking about the variants of uh, concerns of the COVID-19 uh, cases in uh, Baguio City. Uh, and be, before I, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, sir, can, can you quit your sharing? Sorry po, uh, lalabas lang daw muna ako ng, ng Zoom meet. Sorry for that. Okay po, sige po. Thank you. Sige po, let's wait for uh, Professor Adawes uh, yeah, come back. So for the meantime, let's just think of uh, some uh questions that we want to ask to our first and second uh, speaker, Kanina. Okay, and na si, si Ma'am Risa. Ma'am, can you share your screen na po? Yes, sharing po. No problem ba?
can uh, sorry for that can you see my slides now um we can see your slides okay so uh i'm presenting uh, a glimpse of the covid-19 variants of concern in Baguio C2 so this is a, a very descriptive uh, presentation since i didn't uh, uh, have uh, uh, statistical tests for now all you can see for now are all graphs uh, so we can, uh, I, I got rid of the text, so uh, we can just sit and relax for now. Okay, so by the way, I would like to thank the Cordillera Study Center for, give, for awarding us the uh, Interdisciplinary Research Grant for, to be able to do the exploratory data analysis of the COVID-19 cases in Baguio City. So here are my uh, team. So we have here Professor Junas, uh, Ms. Griselda Libatique, who are my co-proponents in the said uh, project with the uh, CSC. And we have here Dr. Donabel Tubera Panes. And we have some volunteers, Joseph uh, Marigman, April Pahimola, and our research assistant is Jean Punsalan. And uh, another volunteer is uh, Miss Shilden Dominguez. All the data we used here are obtained from the Baguio City Health Service Office, which is shared with us through Dr. Adona. Okay. So, uh, as we have known, the COVID-19 is a disease caused by a novel coronavirus which first spread in Yuan, China, last December 2019. And uh, this disease can be contracted from an infection, infected person by uh, droplets or aerosols when that infected person coughs, talks, or sneezes. We can experience, or anyone who have contracted the disease can experience these uh, sim symptoms like fever, dry coughs, headache, dizziness, body pain, uh, vomiting, and diarrhea. Okay, so to 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 talk about the variants, you no, know, we'll just give a few uh, details, you no. Know? Uh, first, we had the alpha variant in Baguio City. This is also called the B.1.1.7, which has uh, originate, originated in uh, United Kingdom, as you can see in the illustration. Okay. And this is highly transmissible, and uh, this has mostly infected ages 20 and below. Okay, so that's alpha. Then we have the beta. This uh, variant is also known as the B.1.551 variant. This was first detected in South Africa and was also present in uh, countries like India, Germany, and United States. So this showed evidences of pre-infection. Okay. And this is the Delta variant. And this was uh, also known as B.1.617.2, or never mind about the numbers. <laughs> this was first detected in uh, where India last May 2021. And a sub-variant of Delta known as Delta Plus variant was reported also last June 11, 2021. As you can see here, uh, the uh, distribution of the cases. So this dark uh, uh, area here is now above 200,000 infections, okay? So this is how uh, the Delta affected India, okay? And now uh, the, om the Omicron or the B.1.1.1.2, which also affected Baguio City, was first detected also in uh, South Africa 
which started in November 2021. The most dominant and highly divergent variant of concern worldwide, actually, with the virus having more than 30 mutations. But I won't talk about the 30 mutations. And it remained as a variant of concern with high total risk associated with this uh, Omicron. Okay, so before we uh, go to the details of the Omicrons in Baguio City or the different uh, variants in Baguio City, let uh, me give you an overview of the total cases of uh, Baguio City as of uh, September 8, 2022. So we've been gathering the data since uh, March, 2020 up to now, no, September 8, 2022. So the green uh, bars here represent the recovered cases, and this comprises about 97.85% of uh, the COVID-19 cases. The blue bars are the actual Active cases. These are daily active cases. And as we can see, there is only about 0.23% as of this time, September, or as of yesterday, September 8th. Okay. And the, the orange represent cumulative deaths. Okay. So we have here about 0.23 are death cases and only about to, I'm sorry, about 2% or 1.93 are death cases, 97.85 are recovered and the rest are still active. And these are the daily cases from September 2 to September 8. So up to date, uh, we now have a total of 43,357 recoveries. Okay. And to show you, this is now the map of the COVID-19 cases this uh, week from September. This is September 8th. This is September 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8. So the, the dark pink represent high-risk areas. The yellow are medium risk and the green are low risk. When we say low risk, we have about one infected per 100,000 individuals. The high risk will have um, greater than seven infected individuals in a population of 100,000 individuals. Okay, now, as you see here, you notice that as we go to September 8, there will be many areas which are low risk and medium risk. Well, it's because we record uh, the dates like the onset of the disease. And the, the, the records or the onsets are actually uh, but we have this late reporting. So, for example, if an individual is uh, uh, found uh, positive of the disease today, then her onset date may be uh, five weeks, uh, five weeks ago, or even a week ago. So you can see that well, this uh, graph is uh, a little bit uh, what confusing. <laughs> Sorry for that. Okay, so these are the daily cases of COVID-19 from May 28, 2020 up to September 3, 2022. Uh, this uh, peak here is the Delta variant. Where before that, we have the alpha and the beta here. Then we have this as the Delta variant. And this is now your Omicron, okay? It has peaked during January or this of this year. Okay? The Delta co caused many deaths, but the Omicron has uh, what few fewer deaths than the Delta. Mm. And uh, 
we can see that starting March 2022, we have uh, what below or the, the minimum level, which is, I think this is uh, 5%. And again, the cases went up starting June up to this time. Okay. So up to this time or the month of September. So if to show you a bigger uh, view of this part is this uh, graph below. So in uh, July 2022, we have 13 cases. And then we reach up to eight, four cases. That's August. And then going down to this, September 8th, we have one. But this number will have to be updated. As I have said, we, re we record on set dates, not the report dates. Okay, so uh, an update for the seven-day moving average by at, uh, as of September 8th, we have nine cases. This means that for a week, that would be nine times seven cases in a week, or we would expect a daily case of nine. So we'd expect nine tomorrow and maybe another nine for the next day. Next, uh, yeah, this is uh, the same graph. Uh, we also present the average daily attack rate. Okay, uh, when we go above five five percent, or the WHO updated this uh, minimum level seven percent. So here, so if we go above seven percent, then that that means we are at high risk, okay? So as you can see, we are still uh, high risk. This is uh, this part here is uh, 5% though, but uh, as I have said, this will be updated. So last August 29, we are actually at uh, the level of the high risk. Okay, now this uh, is now the the, the different uh, statistics on or the numbers on the different uh, variant. As you can see, this is your alpha variant from February up to July 2021. And also the beta, uh, a little, well, it's a lower number than the alpha. It started in April 2021 up to August 2021. Then this is your Delta variant. It's almost have the same length in terms of the number of days as with the Alpha, okay? But what is alarming is that Omicron is the, what, uh, have started in December, okay, 2021 up to this month, August and September. Okay, it has two peaks actually. The peak here is uh, last January and the other one is uh, last July. Okay, we hope this uh, would not increase up to, uh, as we have opened classes of face-to-face -face in the elementary and high school and even some state use and uh, universities in Baguio City. Okay. This is to show you the number of days this different variants uh, occurred or uh, well, uh, as we have in Baguio City. So the longest is actually the Omicron. Okay. And uh, uh, yeah, uh, the, the Omicron has the highest uh, moving average, as you can see here. The delta has only about uh, more than six or six to seven, whereas the Omicron has nine to, to 10 daily. Okay. The alpha has an average of just one a day, and then the, the beta has two per day. Okay. From day one up to day 152, that would be beta. Day one up to day one fifty 
20, well, 7 is your uh, alpha variant. And uh, the Omicron is now from day one up to about 200 plus days in Baguio City. Okay. Uh, this is to show you the, the mean uh, distribution of the different uh, variants. Lowest, of course, is the alpha. The second is the beta. Uh, we can see here that uh, the delta has uh, a bigger moving average or really bigger number of daily occurrence per day. However, uh, because the we've been uh, because Omicron have been here for about 200 days, uh, its mean is lower, but we have extreme number of cases left, like I have said. A while ago, we have eight, nine, and so on. But the, the average is about one or two per day. Okay, so these are the deaths from the different uh, variant. The least is uh, beta, uh, as we record here from March 2021 to 2022 only, we have just recorded one from beta, two from uh the alpha and the 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 most death came from the delta variant so delta is the deadliest variant and we only have two deaths uh, with omicron okay uh these are recoveries so since omicron has the, the highest number and the longest in value city but uh, as we have said in the first slide or the graph, our recovery is about 98%. So these are also the micron, about 98% of them are recovered. Okay. Uh, these are the hospitalization of the um, cases of the different variants. Uh, there are many hospitalizations uh, of the alpha variant. Okay. Uh, a little of the the delta, okay. Although there are many deaths of uh, the delta variant, but uh, with this time interval from March 2021 to August 2022, we only have recorded uh, about one four, you know, within this uh, date intervals, and these are. Okay, hospitalizations, I should say. And these are the number of hospitalizations for the Omicron. Okay. We, we have not included the vaccination status of uh, these cases. So, but uh, maybe we can infer that uh, after the alpha and beta, uh, most of the Baguio residents have their vaccines. And so, the, we have this uh, delta, or we have minimized hospitalizations of delta. But since we have uh, uh, a large number of uh, infections with uh, Omicron, then this is also the results of the hospitalization of uh, cases with the uh, Omicron variant. Okay, uh, this is just to summarize the the number of uh, cases affecting ages 5 to 21. Now, we find this uh, very significant since we now open the, the classes or the elementary and high school and even colleges for the face-to-face -face, uh, learning. So we have here data as uh, about uh, 16 deaths. And uh, alpha, I mean, and then we have beta, and then we have delta. Uh, we can see that the uh, Omicron infections uh, accum accumulated about uh, less than 80. Well, because this is an accumulation of about uh, what? from day one to day 202. Okay. So that's why we have about uh, less than 80 of the cases. Okay. And uh, again, these are the recoveries of ages 5 to 21. So most of them also recovered. Okay. As you can see here, 
the hospitalization or just this uh, uh, match, one, two, three, four for the Omicron. And most of them recovered. Uh, as to date, there's only one death uh, of age five to 21 having the Omicron variant. And these are my references. Okay. And thank you again. Thank you for the invitation to be part of this uh, uh, lecture series. Good morning. Thank you, Ma'am Risa. Thank you for walking us through the uh, COVID-19 concern, uh, variant of concern in Baguio City. So we will proceed now to our uh, last uh, presenter for this uh, morning session. So let me introduce uh, her to you uh, to talk about Baguio City and its remaining green spaces. We have uh, Professor Senaida Bawanan. Uh, Professor Senaida Bawanan obtained her Bachelor of Science in Biology at the University of the Philippines, Baguio, and her master's and PhD degrees in biology from the University of the Philippines, Diliman. She earned a postdoctorate fellowship at the University of Hawaii at Manoa, Honolulu, Hawaii, United States, through the Fulbright Philippine Agriculture Advanced Research Grant. She has been with the Department of Biology College of Science, UP Baguio, since 1994, teaching biology, invertebrate zoology, ecology, science 11, and seminar courses, and has actively mentored graduate students of the MS Conservation and Restoration Ecology and undergraduate thesis students of BS Biology program. She is currently the head of the Biodiversity and Research Management Program of the Cordillera Study Center of UP Baguio. She held relevant positions in scientific societies and organized several conferences and workshops. Her expertise is in the ecology and taxonomy, and she actively engages in multidisciplinary research. Her other accomplishments include papers published in the international and national regional journals, book chapters, and conference proceedings. She has participated in local and international trainings and presented scientific posters and papers with invitations to review or referee research articles and project proposals. She advocates conservation and restoration efforts, particularly in promoting native species. On to you, Ma'am uh, Zeni. Thank you, Sir Joel, for the kind introduction. And let me first thank uh, Dr. Leia Abayao and uh, Dr. Dean Javier for inviting me to uh, this webinar, which is a very significant concerning our beloved city. So let me just uh, share my slide. Uh, so when I was invited by Dr. Divna Javier to um, give a seminar or a webinar regarding the sustainability of Baguio City, so I first hesitated because we are still conducting our uh, research in Baguio City. But then I thought that perhaps I could uh, look at the remaining uh, green spaces, particularly on the remaining urban forests in the city. And so when I was uh, trying to look at some references in the Google, then I came across the green spaces spelled as a single word or a compound noun and uh, two, uh, two words, which is the green spaces that are separated. So when I was at my second slide preparing it for the, this presentation, I wondered I need to define what green spaces are. Mm -hmm. So whether it be a, sing, a two word green spaces or even a single word as green spaces. So when we talk of this uh, two compound noun, then it is easy for us to have a distinct meaning because it is a space that is green or vegetated. But when we talk of green space as a single word or as a, or as a compound noun, then it can denote more than a space that is vegetated 
or is green, but rather uh, there is more to it. It's just analogous to when we say a whiteboard with two words, which is not, and a whiteboard with a single word. When we say whiteboard as a single word, then it's, it's not simply a board that is white, but rather an erasable board that can be used with markers for presentation. And with that analogy, I was able to find this important literature by Taylor and Hochuli in 2017, where they defined green space as a single compound noun and the multiple uses of this term across the multiple disciplines. And based on this article that I came across, I found out that the green space has been used as early as 1967 and has been in usage for a number of decades, but it was only in the turn of the century in 21st century when it has become an emerging field. So green space is now considered as an emerging field of research. So you can see here that there is already a continuing increase in the interest on green space research, um, particularly at the start of the 21st century. But majority of the researchers would prefer to use the term green space as two, uh, two words rather than the green space with only one word. And still going through this uh, study by Taylor and Huchuli, which is a review paper or a meta-analysis of the green space research, you can see here the multidisciplinary approach to this field. So as you can see here, there are many journals with different um, focuses, particularly on architecture or ur urban environment and building. Uh, there are also um, biological sciences, medical and health sciences, agricultural, veterinary and environmental science, policy and political science, economics, behavior and cognitive science, studies on human society, earth sciences, even in education, and history and archaeology. So ganon ka multidisciplinary ang approach when understanding the green spaces. Kaya dito rin realize natin yung complexity of this term. Now still moving forward, when we when the um, uh, when the authors tried to define the green spaces, they were able to come up with the six types of definitions that are identified from more than 200 liter literature that were available. And they are defined according to the acknowledged range, wherein the greenness describes the level of vegetation ranging from sparsely landscaped Street, uh, streets, to tree-lined walkways, to play fields, and forested parks. And then there are also some studies that would simply define the green spaces by giving examples. So these were illustrated with examples. And uh, these are some of these, the combined areas of open land, cropland, uh, urban open open land, pasture, forest, and woody perennial. And uh, some would refer to the green spaces as the green areas with reference to the green or natural areas, but without further explanation. And example of this is when they just state that the area investigated include substantial green elements. Some literature would refer to the green spaces as land use, and it becomes a generic land use described as green space pertaining to recreational or even undeveloped land. But majority of the literature that were presented talk about the green space as vegetated areas, because when we talk of green space, we are referring to spaces that are green. And so it uh, refers to areas that feature the vegetation. And examples of this is when they refer to it 
as green in the sense of being predominantly covered with vegetation. And so uh, by summarizing, there are two different interpretations of green space that are being used. The green space as a nature and the green space as urban vegetated space. And what strikes me here is when we refer to green space as urban vegetated space to include even the allotments or the cemeteries, okay? But uh, still, majority of the literature that would talk about the green space would still refer to the sum of all woody and associated vegetation in and around dense human settlements. So this brings us to the importance of looking at the remaining green spaces in Baguio City. So when we talk about Baguio City, we used to boast it because of its greenery, okay, the scent of the pine, the pine trees, and also the, the parks uh, where people can go, walk, jog, and so on. So if we try to look at uh, the old Baguio City in its 1930s, we can see that there are only few built up areas. And this photo was taken from the National Geographic in May 1913. But looking forward, in 2018, this was the photo credited from uh, Mr. Ompong Tan, we can already see that there are more built up areas than the green spaces. And if we look at the carrying capacity of the city, we look at the population density. In 1939, the population was only 24,117. The, the city of Baguio is designed by the, during the American regime to contain only 25,000 inhabitants. And so if we look at the population density in 1939, there are 419.5 people that are occupying per uh, square kilometer. So this data was taken from Stoke and Mariah in 2013. But in 2015, the population density, the population ballooned to 361,569. So this is way far greater than the population in 1930s, which is actually expected. And so if we look at the population density, there are now 6,289 people occupying per square kilometer. And this data was taken from the ecological profile in 2018, ecological profile of Baguio City. So if we look at the Earth's biocapacity, every person has to occupy 2.1 hectares to be able to benefit from the ecological services that we get from our environment. But in Baguio, there are already, per, per person is now occupying only 1.09 hectare. So clearly, it indicates that we have exceeded the carrying capacity in Baguio. And so therefore, if we look at the Baguio City land use map, this was uh, already presented by Sir uh, Ali, Dr. Ali Siencia a while ago, but um, he was saying that there are some, uh, some, some conflicts with the, in terms of the, the land cover, kung ilang percentage na yung built up, ilang percentage na yung open forest, and so on. But if we look at this Baguio City land use map in 1988, in 1998, in 2009, and um, in the 2015, so we, you can see here that the dark spaces are the built up areas. So there is really an increasing built up areas in the city of Baguio. And uh, in this land use map that was provided to me by Dr. Uh, Recinto Lumbres of the B Benguet State University, it was very kind to uh, share this to me. And it, it states here that the built up area is already 
16.4%. The open forest, it's only 16.74%. The brush shrubs for are 14.37%. Annual crop, 7.67%. The grassland, 0.65%. And open barren is 0.04%. So if we are going to um, sum all of this as uh, as to be considered as the green spaces, we only barely have 40% of the remaining green spaces. Now, based on the World Health Organization, there has to be a balance between the built up areas, uh, especially in urban, urban areas, wherein only 60% should, um, should be allotted for the built up and 40% uh, should be allotted for the green spaces. So it is now a balance between urbanization and the, uh, the improvement and conservation of our remaining green spaces. We, we need to acknowledge that expansion, there is an expansion of existing establishments in the city. They, we can see now more condominium, there are more hotels and restaurants, even the residential areas or residential, used to be residential houses are being converted into hotels or restaurants. And of course, there are more vehicles, especially during peak seasons, like for example, during Panagbenga. And there are more land conversion with uh, many of the green spaces that are owned by private uh, entities and there are more people that are coming to Baguio. And consequently, because of this trend that is happening in the city, we are losing our green spaces. There is an urban heat island effect, wherein um, more built up areas could actually bounce back the heat rather than absorbing it so we can have some uh, albedo effect or we feel warm when we are besides the built up areas and uh, this was already pointed out by dr shiansha so the 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 problem in terms of uh, water security because the, there are more people that are using the water, so there is a threat to water security. And uh, also because of the built up areas, the water cannot actually, cannot actually, press, um, cannot actually um, penetrate the soil so that it can become available in our aquifer. So that's also a threat to the availability of water. And of course, with more people, there are more waste that are generated. We expect a polluted air, which as well compromises our health and our wellness. So as discussed earlier by Dr. Rizabel Adawe, so um, our uh, increase, the increase in, by, by, by boosting our immune system, we can actually uh, combat the effect of the COVID pandemic. So moving forward, because I have uh, talked about uh, air pollution, so um, in the study conducted by Clemente in 2006, particularly in Baguio City, so there are four major sources of carbon dioxide emission in the city in terms of the tons. And these are coming from the residential areas, the commercial areas, industrial, and transportation. So we therefore expect that uh, in the recent time, there are more carbon dioxide that are being emitted in our atmosphere, which can be very alarming. And so we can equate our green spaces with the ecosystem services in terms of the regulation of our microclimate, the water retention, which can secure our water need, and also on the nutrient cycling so that we cannot build up on the uh, waste that are being thrown in our environment, and green spaces as the home to diverse life forms and as means for in for our health, wellness, in terms of recreation. And so let's try to 
work by the numbers. In the study that we have conducted at GSIS Tree Park, so this is the park that is close to the convention center and UP Baguio. Um, so we were able to come up with the assessment of the biodiversity at the GSIS Tree Park alone. And I was with uh, Mr. Dane, Dane um, Soriano with uh, Chancellor Corazon Abansi with a collaboration with Professor Lizelle Magtoto when we conducted this. And this was um, funded by the Cordillera Study Center uh, through the interdisci interdisciplinary uh, interdisciplinary research grant funding. And if we look at this, uh, at the GSIS alone, there are already 49 plant species from various plant families, and there are 35 invertebrates from different invertebrate groups, and 24 bird species from a 2012 to 2018 avian survey that was provided by Professor Jocelyn Floresca. So it means that um, our tree parks which uh, are part of our green spaces, are really home for this diverse flora and fauna. And there are even some endemic species that are found on the GSIS tree park, and that would include the Philippine pygmy uh, woodpecker foraging on a dead Benguet pine tree, and also an endemic pine looper, the Millionia coronifera. And uh, also, when we look at the green spaces in terms of the well-being of the people that are residing in the urban areas, so we can see here that the remaining green spaces can actually enhance the physical activity and improve the fitness of the people, and can even enhance, which can uh, eventually enhance or boost our immune system, as provided in this figure. And also, the green space can improve the mental health and even the cognitive function. And uh, the greater surrounding greenness has been linked actually to this improved mental health in all socioeconomic strata. So it doesn't matter if you're a poor or rich. So having green spaces surrounding you can improve the mental health and the cognitive function based on this study. And also, the green space can reduce cardiovascular morbidity, which is one of the high uh, cause of fatality or mortality. And uh, in this study by Pereira, they found out that there are lower odds of hospitalization, self-reported heart disease or stroke among adults with highly variable greenness around their homes. And so therefore, for, for those who are living in uh, the city, sometimes we take for granted the things that we get from our environment because we take it for free. Majority of our parks are uh, free for the people and also the air that we breathe is free. And so for us to become more aware of the values that we actually receive from our ecosystem, sometimes we need to put values to this so that we can appreciate more of the things that we get from our environment. And in this paper that was published in uh, 2013 by Stoke and Murayama. So they look at the landscape pattern and the ecosystem service value changes to look at the implications on environmental sustainability planning for the rapidly urbanizing uh, summer capital of the Philippines, which is Baguio City. And in their paper, they uh, look at the land use or land cover in terms of the forest, the brushland, the cropland, and the value of the ecosystem services that are taken from these green spaces. So you can see here that they are in millions of pesos from 1988 to 2009. But because of the changes in the land use or in the land cover, we can see here that we are already incurring deficits in the ecosystem service values that we get. 
And in 2009, so you can see here that it has already increased to less than 3,148. So nagiging deficit na talaga yung nakukuha natin na uh, ecosystem services due to the changing landscape. And with the study that we have conducted with uh, Chancellor Abansi way back in 2018 through the CSC ITRG project, there, there, uh, her, her work was on, the peop on looking at the valuation or looking at the people's perception on the value of the urban, urban forest park, particularly the JSIS tree park. And I'm just showing here the highlights of her, uh, of her results. And um, she found out that the respondents or the research participants in the research are aware of both the use and the non-use values of the parks. Now, in terms of the use values, they are aware that there are indirect use, which are ecological in nature, such as the absorbing and trapping carbon emissions to reduce the microclimate uh, change and also on water retention and uh, as serving as home to diverse life forms and also as option and bequest values. But in terms of non-use values, the mere existence, existence of these uh, parks for cultural and historical value are already uh, are appreciated. And there is also a strong agreement that park is valuable simply because it exists. And therefore the people residing near parks or green spaces and other stakeholders would see a tree park clearly enough to value them as elements of a well-planned city. Now, again, looking at some quantitative assessment, it showed that 85% of the um, research participants were willing to pay or to contribute to a fund in order to, um, in order to maintain the green spaces for personal and also societal benefits and to protect the undisturbed nature or the remaining green spaces and because of their concern for biodiversity. But there are also few who are not willing to pay, particularly because they think that park is a government property and therefore the government is the, the, government is the sole, respon sole responsible for the maintenance of the green spaces. But others would also reason out that their current economic difficulty constrains them from contributing for the maintenance of our green spaces. And the mean willingness to pay based from logistic estimation is worth 56.34, which means that if you're going to contribute or pay, uh, or what, what amount will you be will, willing to pay for the, for the green spaces, then they've said that uh, 50, it, it, it should be 56.34. But the factors that would affect the willingness to pay by the respondents would be based on the bid amount, the household income, and the age of the respondents. And uh, because of all of this, we, we were trying to make some recommendations in terms of how we can actually maintain or even improve our green spaces. So as you can see, because of the land conversion, even because of the road widening, so we, we the the there really has to be at the expense of some of our green spaces. So we were hoping that there we can establish a tree cutting moratorium within the city in order to mitigate the adverse effects of deforestation, which may exacerbate the effects of human-induced global warming and climate change. And we also need to promote multi-sectoral governance, including the issuance of permits when they, there is uh, land conversion projects, or even in monitoring the restoration activities that would promote native plants. As you can see, majority of the plants that we can see now are introduced species which can become invasive. So it's about high time that we can introduce our native vegetation.
and that there should be compliance with the structural designs that is fit for a green city, including connectivities of our remaining forest fragments. Later on, uh, Dr. Aris Rehenaldo would actually look at how uh, habitat fragmentation can affect our wildlife. And um, it is important that we increase our forest cover to 40%. So not just uh, the entire green spaces, but even the, the, the forest cover should be 40% na nga eh. Pero tinitingnan na natin kanina, collective pa yan na mga green spaces na 40%. Kasi the importance of the forest cover uh, should be on the premise of the geohazard status of the city. Diba? Prone tayo because of the faults. So the trees can actually maintain the soil and also to prevent water scarcity as pointed out by Dr. Ciencia. And uh, furthermore, we also need to manage the prevalence of the exotic or alien species, uh, which may lead to biodiversity loss of native flora and fauna species and may negatively affect the quality of our remaining green spaces. As I mentioned earlier, makikita natin sa ating surrounding itong African tulip or the Spathodea, this should be Campanulata, and also um, the Caliandra. Uh, which is also becoming prominent in the parks and even the ipil ipil or the liokena lioko uh, cephala and uh, also the lantana camera or yung sinasabi natin na bangbangsit. So currently, um, I am working on looking at the ecological impact of this African tulip in our city parks together with uh, Dr. Lizel Magtoto and uh, Mr. Jonas uh, Viernes of the Department of Mathematics. And uh, the, the project is also being funded by the Cordillera Study Center Interdisciplinary, Interdisciplinary Research Grant. But um, if we try to look at uh, our remaining green spaces, there are some promising native plants that we need to use for restoration, such as the Hoya multiflora, which is native, and also the Neolithia species, which is a tree that we've spotted. And um, of course, we have to start from our own backyard. And uh, in UP Baguio, for instance, we have this Native Plants Committee, and we are already looking at how we can restore our remaining green spaces, spaces by promoting the native plants. Currently, the Native Plants Committee is lodged under the College of Science and headed by Dr. Wilfredo Alanki. And with this, um, given that the residents and the stakeholders could actually attach values to the urban forest parks as an exa example of a green space, we need to have a strong policy support at the local level. And it is imperative to heighten the people's awareness of the range of benefits from urban parks and other green spaces. And there should be more efforts that are devoted to engagement in information, education and communication activities, and capacity building and policy lobbying. So this webinar that is sponsored by the, by the College of Social Science together with the College of Science is a way of engaging our, uh, our people to be involved on how we can maintain and improve our green spaces. And uh, the University of the Philippines Baguio was also actively involved with the CEPMO or the City Environment and Park, Parks Management Office. And we're trying to uh, find a way on how we can improve our green spaces. I've been... Um, I've been in contact with attorney Renan Diwas of the CEPMO, and we're, we're trying to look at the best ways on how we can actually do our part in maintaining our green spaces. So with the rapid population growth and urban expansions, these are clearly exerting pressure on Baguio's natural landscape. 
jeopardizing the environmental sustainability of this highly valued hill station. And therefore, it is time to have a sound urban management plan and to promote, promote the green tourism. I, I'm sure that attorney, uh, I, I mean uh, architect Donna Tabangin will talk more about the plans in the city of Baguio. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your kind attention. Good morning. Thank you very much, Ma'am Seni. And that's the uh, end of the, I mean, lecture for this uh, morning session. So we will now proceed to another uh, exciting and interesting part of our program. So the question and answer uh, portion. May we ask Professor Ali Siencia and also uh, Professor Rosel and Professor Risa to uh, open their camera. So for our participants uh, today, uh, you may want to post your questions on the Q&A box, or you may want to raise your hand and uh, ask your, per your question directly to our uh, present presentation. So to give you a brief uh, recap of uh, the presentation earlier, we have Baguio City as a resilient city, as a safe uh, city, uh, the descriptive uh, presentation of the variant uh, concern or concern variant of COVID in Baguio City and also the remaining uh, green spaces in the city. So I think we have a question here. Uh, I think this is addressed to Professor Ali. Uh, let me read uh, this one, uh, Sir Ali. What is the impact of rising infrastructure condominiums, hotels, resident commercial buildings as seen within our city to the city's capacity of being a resilient community? So that's the first question. Or will this type of infrastructure development, condominiums, hotel, et cetera, mean a boon or bane to the city's welfare? So let me read again the question. What is the impact yeah. of rising infrastructure uh, to the city capacity of being a resilient community or will this type of infrastructure development mean a boon or a bane to the city's uh -huh. Sir Ali. Okay, um, thank you for that question. Um, it is not an easy question for me to answer. Um, first of all, I am not an urban planner like um, architect um, Tabangin. I am not um, a geologist like Dean um, Javier or even a professor who teaches yung sa MS care natin like um, Dr. Bawanan. Um, but I, there are, I think there are at least two perspectives. There's, I, I, I became aware of the argument that um, high rise infrastructures like buildings are in fact good for a city because instead of building yung pahaba ng mga buildings or structures, pag pataas yung mga buildings natin, then you allow for more green space. It allows for, okay, we can plant more trees, we have you know, forest cover, okay? So may argument na ganon. Um, I am in fact aware na merong administrator dito sa Baguio, he's in, in fact proposing that we have more condominiums kesa yung mga pahaba ng mga na, na structures. Um, but on the other hand, the problem in Baguio City, at ito nabanggit din ni Dr. Bawanan, yun nga carrying capacity. And again nga, sabi natin, may shortfall ng water supply relative to yung um, demand of the people. So whether pat pahaba or pataas, pag padami ng padami ang residents ng Baguio City, then we will, ibig sabihin nito, then we will be exerting more pressure on yung water that is available. Di ba? Parang, okay. So it's not simply a question. So maganda, if you have okay, high-rise structures, then we can have a larger forest cover. Maganda yun. Pero at the same time, pag high-rise yung structure mo, then you will need more, okay, need pressure to bring water from the ground going up ito. Sa Baguio, mahirap may mga lugar na hindi nakakaakit yung tubig, so gagamit sila ng mga motors para umakit lang yung tubig. Then, I, don't, I guess mga, uh, mga geologists would say that this would lead to subsidence. Magsisink yung ground natin kasi mawawala agad yung tubig. At the same time, 
yung, the city is also uh, vulnerable to earthquakes. Mas vulnerable ba ang mga condominium sa earthquake kaysa yung mga malilit na structures? So we have to consider this. In, it's not simply a question of ano. It's not simply a question of high structures or low structures, but you have to take into account subsidence, water pressure, carrying capacity, vulnerable to, vulnerability to earthquakes, so marami pang iba. I hope that answers the questions. And of course, I would defer to the expertise of um, Architect Bangin, Dr. Bawan, and, and we have here. Thank you very much for that insight, uh, Sir Ali. I think we can uh, ask Professor Senaida Bawanan of her insights regarding this question, since this is somehow related to, to her topic also, Ma'am Ma Zen. Mm -mm. Uh, so the, the question was uh, with regards to water scarcity, you know? Ma'am, uh, yes, Ma'am. And more specifically on the impact of rising infrastructure in the development of uh, you know city and the city welfare well of course uh, the 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 build the, the the build up areas are actually displacing our remaining green spaces so that poses a threat to uh, water security nga. and we know that the forests uh, help control the water cycle particularly nga doon sa pagre-regulate ng precipitation and then yung evaporation and even uh, yung mga flows ng water kasi they can help um Ano nga eh, store, store yung water. Okay. Eh. So it's, it's really very important. Now, because of the need for urbanization, kasi nga, we, we are living in a city, so hindi mo talaga rin maikakaila that there is a need for built-up areas. So I think, uh, I, I'm not also claiming to be an expert in terms of landscaping, so that is the forte of uh, architect Donna, but what we can actually uh, help in promoting would be the use of the green wall, uh, yung paglalagay kahit na may mga built up areas maglalagay pa rin ng mga green walls so ito yung mga parang uh, naka mga structures wherein lalagyan pa rin siya ng tanim pero pa pa ano na pa, ver pa vertical okay so meron pa rin mga tanim diyan and also uh, in in some cities like in the uh, in C in central in cent or even in Central Luzon State University, they're already advocating the use of aquaponics. So this can also at, at, uh, um, at uh, more wider range nga ng, at a wider range nga of um, defining a, a green space we can actually uh, ref, we can actually look at aquaponics as another remedy so because of the uh, lacking spaces so pwede tayong mag uh, turn into aquaponics and we can still uh, have mm. all of this uh, the of, of this greenery in our environment Thank you. So I hope I added some points regarding the inquiry. Thank you, Ma'am Sen. I think uh, highlighting the concept of water security, there's a, there are uh, questions here from an alumna of UP Baguio, Dr. Ven Paolo Valenzuela, research fellow at the National University of Singapore. Uh, this is addressed uh, mainly to Sir Ali, but Dr. Balmores and Dr. Uh, Bawanan is also uh, cited here. When This is the question. Uh, when talking about water security and resilience, we need to understand the water stress scenario of the city. What are the major water stress events in the past? And what are the projected future scenarios? Uh, I think this is addressed to Professor Siencia. Let me just read... Uh, uh, for Professor Balmores. While your presentation is focused on crime, Ma'am Roselle, I hope to understand how can these water stress scenarios relate to people's perception of security of the city? And for Dr. Bawanan, uh, to how and to what extent can current state of the green spaces of the city address the water scarcity situation of uh, Baguio City? So I think uh, Sir Ali will, will answer the, the first question. Uh, water stress scenario in the past and what are the projected future scenarios and then Ma'am uh, Balmores in relation to water security also and then uh, Professor uh, Bawad. Sige, sir. Okay. Maraming salamat, Dr. Ven Vavlo, 
Paolo Sujante could not probably say. Okay, when we talk of water, again, I am not a geologist or even an expert on uh, urban planning, but when you talk of water stress, I understand it, it is when um, water demand exceeds water supply. So if you look at our um, the table that I presented, Kanina, 2013, okay, it was recorded already that you have a shortfall of 16 million cubic meters of water bottle, 16,000. Now, in 2022, it has increased to 27. Okay. Now, the point here is that there has been water stress even before 2013. I think my study in Nagsabe 2002. It was the time when okay the when this was breached. In other words, okay, water stress became more observable in the city in 2002. Kung, kung, if we do yung com computation na to, by 2000 or earlier, okay, water demand was more or less equal to water supply, but afterwards, ito na, it's a shortfall. So, um, I, 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 again, I am simply relying on the studies of other people as to the future, okay? Now, hindi natin alam kung dumami ba ang population ng Baguio City, okay? Komonte ba nung pandemic at dadami ba later on, but we again, the, 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 our tendency is to expect that it will be okay, increasing and at the same time. So I cannot, um, Paolo, I cannot identify very specific moments kung kailan okay, naramdaman talaga yung water stress. But I've been a resident of Baguio for as long as I can remember. Even before 2002, I was already aware na water, at least water from the tap is not always available. So even siguro yung claim na 2000 to baka mas maaga pa. Okay. So um, Paolo, I cannot, okay, uh, I, I, can, I can only say that we can project that we will have more instances of water stress in the future. I cannot predict kung kailan exactly mangyayari, pero again, um, even the Bawad is already, already saying that there is now a shortfall. In other words, water stress is already here. I hope that answers your question. <clears throat> Thank you, Sir Ali. Uh, Mom Ma Ma Rosel? Yeah, uh, hi. Uh, good uh, morning. Pa ba? Yeah, good morning. Thank you for the question, uh, Dr. Valenzuela. Yes, uh, in uh, quite similar to Sir Ali's uh, response, I cannot directly answer your question because for one, it, it did not really cover, no? I, I did not really cover this in my study. But if um, uh, if I will refer you back no, to the framework on Safe Cities Index, um, ang water security or concerns about our services, for instance, or available services, kasama yon sa Safe Cities Index. So um, uh, like earlier, I mentioned about um, five domains, no? <clears throat> and kasama dun yung infrastructure, isa din sa tanong kanina, kasama din yung personal, at yun lang yung medyo naging focus ko dun sa aking study, personal safety, which is on crime, uh, particularly. And then, there's health as well, which is uh, covered din yung mga ibang mga napag-usapan, pwede pang mapag-usapan tungkol sa safety. Yung concern natin about water, pwedeng pumasok yun on environmental safety <clears throat> So, ang aspiration, uh, although hindi kita masasagot nga ng malino doon, no? ang, ang aspiration is definitely when it comes to perception, pwedeng masakop lahat yun, no in terms of safety and security perception. Yun ang goal, yun yung aspiration na sana makover lahat itong indicators na to on safe cities. Um, kaya lang, syempre, ang hirap i-cover lahat yun in just one study. Pero sana yun yung isang maging makita natin, makita rin yung perception ng mga mga current residents ngayon no about um yun ano ba yung tingin nila with with respect to let's say yung yung water services um like uh, sir Ali matagal na rin akong residente ng Baguio and i recall no nung bata kami no hindi pa wala naman talagang tangke no yung walang tank ngayon kasi talagang parang very basic yun na dapat bawat bahay meron ka ng water tank kasi hindi na predictable or predictable yung yung tubig pero hindi na araw-araw katulad noon something like that so magandang tignan yung perception ng mga tao in relation to let's say mga new residents versus let's say yung mga uh, matagal ng residents yung mga sabi nga nating baggy old timers 
in terms of their perception of water security and uh, safety in general. Thank you. Thank you. And then, yeah, si Dr. Bawano. Okay, uh, just to add doon sa sinabi nga rin ni Dr. Alice Ciencia earlier about uh, water security. Now, um, if we try to look at the remaining green spaces, particularly yung mga watersheds natin, so supposedly protected yung ating mga watersheds. Uh, take for example yung ating, uh, yung ating Bosol, Bosol Watershed, and then yung Buyog Watershed. Nak uh, very familiar kayo dito sa Buyog Watershed. Ito yung nakikita niyo na parang green patch lang pag nasa SM kayo tapos nakikita niyo na napapalibutan siya ng maraming buildings that boy, that's boyog and one problem that as, that is associated with the diminishing green spaces is because of encroachment yung supposedly na mga watersheds natin that can become a so, the watersheds that uh, are the source of uh, our potable water ay na, na kumukonti na kasi nga napapalitan na siya ng mga uh, informal settlers. So we really have to do something about it. Even Camp Chanhe, which is supposed to be uh, housing the uh, the the green patches or the green spaces in uh, Baguio City. Meron na rin yung mga nearby residents na medyo nag encroach na rin doon sa uh, Camp Chanhe. So we really have to do something about this. And uh, even even yung mga invasive plants or yung mga introduced plants that uh, we, we see here in the city, some of this can also be a threat to water security kasi um, iba yung iba sa kanila matako sa tubig eh so instead na mag they help in the security of water mas sila pa yung nag-accumulate take for instance pag kami mga nakikita kayo na mahogany pansin niyo doon sa sa ano niya yung sa surrounding area niya very dry kasi kin, ma, marami yung kinoconsume na, na tubig and i've been uh, hearing these anecdotes about alnus which is also an introduced species na medyo nagkakaroon ng uh, limited water pagka may mga uh, present na alnus. That's why we need to really replace this uh, potential invasive plants with uh, the native plants that can help in regulating the water cycle. Example of this would be the ficus or yung tinatawag natin na tibig. Kasi makikita natin to malapit dun sa mga uh, source ng water because they help in uh, securing water source. So I hope uh, I added some ideas about the question posted. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Ma'am Ma Zen, and also Ma'am Rosen and Sir Ali. Uh, I think the, the next question uh, is addressed to Professor uh, Risa. Uh, Ma'am, uh, with the low mortality rate of COVID, there is a perception now that there is no longer a COVID concern, so restriction should be relaxed. So what's your comment on this book? <laughs> Again, uh, the question is with the low mortality rate of COVID, there is a perception, again, perception now, okay, by the residents, siguro, that there is no longer a COVID concern. So restrictions, government restrictions, I think, should be relaxed. What is your comment on this book? So, ma'am, uh, recently. <laughs> Yes, good, good morning. Uh, hindi rin ako expert sa ano, uh, sa, kasi hindi naman ako doktor. Pero as I see the, the data, no, uh, I think it's too early that uh, we relax uh, uh, the restrictions in wearing masks and even the uh, disinfections in our uh, work areas. Uh, especially today that we have opened uh, classes in the school children, elementary and the high school. So we should at least maybe uh, extend or still observe these uh, restrictions maybe for three months, siguro, and until we see that the, we stabilize uh, uh, a, a lower number of cases, especially now that, uh, uh, yeah, it's going down, but uh, we aren't 
uh, it's not consistent yet. So maybe until such a time uh, that we can observe uh, about uh, 14 or 14 days or a length of one month that we observe a low um, daily attack rate. When I say low, we should uh, observe a uh, 5% ADAR. That would be five cases per 1,000 for 100,000 individuals. So in the case of Baguio, uh, for the population, which I've seen for the, from the report of uh, Dr. Bowanen, it's about three, 361,000 or 100,000 in Baguio. It's now about the, the updated population. It's now about uh, uh, 300, uh, 74 or yeah 374,000 so with the computation of the attack rate we round up to 400,000 times five so we should ex expect about uh, 15 or uh, below 15 cases uh, daily no that would be considered the uh, a low ADAR rate in uh well we have not considered the the increase you sorry that the the term no i i forgot the term but at least uh, what i'm saying is uh, we should have lower than 15 cases daily okay or any lower say yung yung kanina na report is nine but that's uh uh, underreported kasi uh, alam naman natin na uh, we do testing like yung test may test kit na kasi di ba so we when we do test kit test no and we are positive we don't go to the Baguio City Health Service office and report right so what are reported today are those uh, with the um, moderate to uh, what yung grabe na cases and they go to the hospitals. So yung mild like konting sipon, fever, and so on are not really reported. So these reports like the numbers that uh, I've uh, shown you are the ones reported at the Baguio City Health Service Office. Okay, or this is much, much lower than the actual cases. So I'm not uh, recommending uh, well, removing masks or even disinfections within the areas. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, ma'am, for uh, that clarification. And also, yeah, uh, for your suggestion. Uh, I think uh, these two questions, I just digest it into one. Uh, for Dr. Bawanan on green spaces, I think uh, these two questions are asking about uh, what are the there are there sustainable environmental law and enforcement uh, implemented by the city government of Baguio with regards to uh, you know mitigating the impact of you know environmental concerns here in the city of Baguio and then secondly uh, in having more green spaces is there an estimate percentage now for or amount that indicates how much population can be possibly reduced in, in Baguio City. So uh, law and, in, and infl implementation and also uh, the, the estimate percentage of uh, the pollution that can be possibly reduced in Baguio, Ma'am. A percentage of pollution? Yes po. Uh, sabi niya, yeah, estimate percentage or amount that indicates how much of pollution can be possibly reduced in Baguio? Uh, I'm sorry, I think wala akong immediate na answer doon sa question, but I know that the DNR has been monitoring the air pollution uh, quality or the air quality. May, may mga nakaset up na, ano eh, na mga instruments 
strategically yung isang malap doon sa may lower session road tapos nakikita doon may monitor nila yung uh, air quality so um, i think baka sila yung mas nasa proper position to answer that question so i apologize if i don't have the immediate answer to that and uh, with regards naman doon sa policies sa local policies i think uh, at um, architect donna can also be in a better position to answer to that but of course of course there are some uh, some some laws that would actually um, parang parang ano covering na yan eh yung entire country uh, with uh, respect to keeping keeping the environment safe for all the uh, for all the Filipinos eh. So meron yung mga ganyang existing laws. But uh, currently, ang, ang city environment and parks management are looking at the urban forest management plan in the city. So tinitingnan dito yung mga areas kung saan pwedeng mag-conduct ng mga restoration or uh, tree planting activities para mag-increase yung ating uh, green spaces. And there, uh, I, I, thought, I think that there are also some plans to um, to really look at how the government can buy some properties so that may increase din yung ating mga green spaces. Again, uh, architect Donna would uh, probably know more about it later this afternoon yata yung kanyang talk. Thank you, Mamzan. I think uh, it's also, uh, I'm going to follow up this question because uh, this is uh, in relation also to your discussion earlier po. In reading the city of, I don't know if this is reading from an anonymous attendee. In reading the city, the city of uh, invasive species like the African uh, tulip tree, is Sepmo uh, willing to cut down the African trees found in Burnham Park, Rizal Park, etc., or other parks in Baguio, okay. or is Sepmo requiring the mention study from UP regarding its effect on our ecosystem before they remove such trees? Are there tree cutting permits from the NR needed for these kinds of uh, trees. Okay, so uh, um, I, I think the budget ko nang kanina yah that we we are currently having a project that is funded by the Cordillera Studies Center with me, um, Dr. Lizel Magtoto and uh, Junas Viernes, and uh, we are looking at the um, the status of the African tulips and its threat to the city. And uh, we are actually closely coordinating with the city environment and parks management, and they are very helpful. They are actually assisting us in conducting our uh, our field works. They are providing us with their uh, manpower and also transportation. So we are very thankful for them because they are really uh, working closely with us to address the problem that can be related to the African tulips. Mm -hmm. So as of now we are still on the uh, data gathering stage but the sepmo are already trying to somehow mitigate the impact of the african tulips by doing regular pruning so kinakat lang muna nila the problem with the african tulip kasi is when you cut them kahit na yung magpo-prune prune ka lang ang bilis din kasi nilang tumubo and they can also um, reproduce through suckers. So parang may mga tumutubong maliliit na saplings close to the mother tree. And that can become, uh, that can grow into a mature tree. Kaya mga papansin ninyo yung mga African tulips, di ba parang magkakadikit-dikit na sila. Kasi they can also reproduce asexually through yung mga suckers nga. Pa pa para silang mga mangrove na yung may mga suckers na biglang tumutubo na and uh, nagro-grow na yan into a mature tree. So uh, we hope that uh, once we are done with the, with the project, we can also uh, uh, address the problem that are related with this invasive species. Thank you. Thank you for Ma'am Zen. Uh, yung next question po is addressed to Sir Ali from uh, Sir Aris. Meron bang abiso, Sir, mula sa Bawadi kung safe or hindi safe na inumin ng tubig ng uh, bawadi supplies to residents of Baguio. Hi, Aris. Um, 
Tuwing magkaka-brown out sa, sa Baguio, okay, tinitignan ko yung Facebook at yung advisory ng Beneco. Di ko alam kung nagbibigay ng advisory ang Baguio Water District at kung meron sila sa, sa Facebook. Um, in 2013, and this was included in our in the UP Baguio study on water security, we cited a, um, a study conducted by the Sanitation Division of the Baguio Health Department. So this was 2013. And it, it, it compared uh, water samples um, obtained from Baguio Water District and water samples uh, obtained from water refilling stations. Ang lumabas sa study, um, the Bawadi water was of poorer quality. That was 2013. I am not aware of um, kung merong update, updated study um, at this time. But if you really look at the situation of Bawadi, okay, even if they do their best to make their water really clean, really potable, dadaan pa rin sa mga pipelines natin yan eh. At marami sa pipelines natin luma na kinakalawang na. So unlike yung water refilling station, okay, pag na, na, na purify nila water, ilalagay nila sa bottles, mas malinis na yon. Yung Bawadi, even if they try their best talaga, kasi dadaan sa water pipelines natin, by the time na dumating sa bahay natin, ba it may not be as clean as it was originally. Okay, so um, so I, I think that somehow explains kung bakit people would rather rely on yung water refilling stations than on baggy water. I know that some people can actually drink water from yung, yung taps or faucets sa bahay nila. Pero nasanin na tayo sa Baguio kasi in the 1990s, we always boil water bago. Ano eh, palamigin para inumin. So, um, that, that's how I would answer. I, I, I'm, hindi ko alam kung nagbibigay ng abiso yung, yung Bawadi eh. Pero, and I don't think the Bawadi would say na manan to big namin. I mean, because mm -hmm. I know they're doing their best to purify and to clean their water. Mm -hmm. Just to add lang siguro, ano, kahit hindi ako natanong. Uh, based lang dun sa experience, kasi... I'm residing at Gibraltar at yung bahay namin is very close to the pumping station, mga few meters uh, few meters away lang siya. Pero napapansin namin that there are times na yung lumalabas na tubig from 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 the faucet are actually murky. May mga may mga lupa-lupa na siya minsan. So ibig sabihin nito parang it's already an indication eh na medyo threatened talagang threatened na yung ating ano, yung ating water water security natin which is a sad thing yeah um, i know for some families because they're also having a hard time budgeting their their finances they would just boil it the water from 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 the ano and then drink it but i i don't know if this is the practice of other uh residents of Baguio, but i know some mm -hmm. uh, of other families yeah uh, yeah, wala rin akong alam na may abiso from from Bawati. But yun po, thank you po for for the insights uh Professor Ali and Ma'am Zen. Uh, and uh, if I may add, may mga ibang communities na nagre-rely pa rin doon sa spring water. Hmm. Pero because of the increasing land conversion, ginagawa na nila mga condominium 'yan, nawawalan na rin ng source. Uh, from the spring ang ilang communities so yeah uh kanina po sabi ni uh, dr ven thanks for the answer i'm also doing work on water security in urban areas and this provide me good insights on how to investigate these issues within the region uh, thank you dr ben i think uh the next question is addressed to Professor Risa again. Uh, again, this is about COVID-19. Okay, we are slowly transitioning back to face-to-face. -to -face. However, there are chances that something like this may and can happen. Other countries were more prepared since they have pandemic law, loss and preparedness and the like, which helped them adjust better. So what about Baguio on the local level? I think he's asking about uh, policies. Uh, on you know covid covid still i mean managing covid situation in the city okay uh, maybe uh what i could say is that well uh, i can say that baguio city has much more um 
uh, what you call this concern or uh, stronger policy making when uh, it comes to uh, this uh, COVID-19 as uh, as I have uh, experienced working with uh, Dr. Donna Tubera, the the data that uh, we received from their office uh, has been very useful in uh, making uh, uh, policies with regards to uh, this COVID-19 and the team actually, uh, especially uh, ako, no? Every day, ako nagre-report kay, kay Doc with regards to the update nung kung ano nang nangyari sa data, ilan, ilan, yung, ilan yung case, ano na yung level, ganon. So every, every week silang nagbi-meeting. No? And actually, every day, Dr. Adona asked the, uh, updates from me with regards to the analysis. And uh, well, I guess our mayor... Uh, Mayor Magalong uh, has been in uh, in contact with Dr. Dona. Sa araw-araw, mula nung March 2020, araw-araw po ang communication namin uh, through Dr. Dona, yung results ay pinapasa kay Mayor. And uh, I'm, I'm sure uh, the Mayor and the Health Office have been uh, doing a lot uh, on this. At saka ang mga policy natin ay uh, laging nakabase sa kung anong meron tayo na yung actual na nangyayari sa sa mga cases. Now, with regards to kung ano man yung yung decision on the policies, uh, I think uh well, in, wala naman ako sa authority na magsabi na magaling tayo sa policy making. No? But uh, uh, ang masasabi ko lang ay nakatutok naman tayo sa kung ano yung mga nangyayari about COVID-19. And sa ngayon, uh, hindi naman tayo basta-basta nagbubukas ng, ng eskwelahan. No? Kailangan natin ng mga safety seal. Gaya rin ng uh, ginawa natin dito sa Baguio. So we applied for the safety seal, binisita tayo at nabigyan tayo ng safety seal. So I think all the schools, lahat ng establishments, mga offices need the safety seal para lang makapag uh, papasok ng mga employees. So, sorry, did I answer the question? Yes, yeah, I think uh, Ma'am, you answered the question. Thank you po. Yeah, Sir just, Yuwao? Yes, yes, uh, Chansey. Yeah, uh, kahit hindi ako resource person, uh, I'd like to share doon sa tanong na policy. Kasi we, we did a multidisciplinary study. This is also funded by CSE, ITRD. Uh, on the policy response of the city government of Baguio uh, with respect to COVID-19 pandemic. So we are, tatlo kami dito. Uh, the first one is uh, Prof uh, VCAA, Rose Marie Gutierrez. So ang tinignan niya yung policies related to health. Uh, which is very important at that time. Ako ang tiningnan ko yung economic policies uh, that have been adopted by the city to address the, the implications of the pandemic. And Professor Ruth uh, Tindaan addresses how the, the policies with respect to communicating to people and making people aware uh, of the consequences of the pandemic and how what what better ways to communicate so that people would comply or follow or or appreciate the efforts of the local government. So doon sa health, uh, although I will just recall from the presentation ni VC Rose because we did a presentation uh, during the CSC anniversary lecture. Yung sa health, si, si, si uh, nakita naman niya, tama yung sabi ni Prof. Isabel Adawe, that uh, there is very a very close monitoring done by the city health office on the conditions of COVID-19 and uh, relevant uh, uh, infrastructure and measures were taken by the city. Uh, but of course, there are still rooms for improvement kasi siyempre naman, uh, bigla, bigla yan eh. But, but uh, overall, I think the, the evaluation was the city was able to respond uh, quickly. Uh, in terms of the health uh, uh, procedures and uh, processes. Yung sa akin naman, because I look at the economic uh, 
policies that has been put in place by the city. So I, there I discuss the, the, the fiscal policies that has been implemented by the local government, the priming of the economy, the local economy, given that there was a decline in the gross domestic product of the city and uh, the, 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 the kind of interventions that were given to various sectors like the transportation, the tourism sector, the SM, S, medium and small uh, enterprises and the household. So diniscuss lahat yan, yung mga aids na nabigay, lahat ng mga, na, mga, mga ordinances that has been uh, approved by the city para maibalik yung economy of Baguio from pre, slowly to pre-pandemic levels. And then I think si Professor Ruth was able to analyze the communication strategy of uh, Baguio City uh, and how people would, would be able to appreciate and understand how to deal with the COVID-19 pandemic. So I think overall, the city did well in terms of promptly and, and accurately and appropriately responding to, to the uh, consequences of the COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you very thank much. You. Yeah, thank you, Po Chansey, uh, for your meaningful insights with regards to you know uh, the collaboration between the academe and also the uh, local government unit. Uh, there is this uh, comment from uh, retired professor uh, Wang Bukiren, and also a question which I think is addressed to everyone. Uh, and let me just read. Uh, to you, the comment. I'm happy to know that there have been astan uh, astounding actions on the side of the civil society, the academe, NGOs, media, students, and the rest in the public sector that push forward protecting Baguio City's well being, especially environment and human population. Uh, this is the question Can there be tighter coordination and collaboration between those? in such efforts since 1990 and the LGU offices, uh, CPDO, CEPMO, Tourism, Mayor's Office, Sangguni Ang Panglunsod, to ensure science-guided rehabilitation, redevelopment, improved urban planning and management, status of ideas and plans regarding Burnham Park, Botanical Garden, Watershed, Barangay Parks will please reach the public in timely manner so as to in to be involved too. There have been comments from and observations and suggestions regarding exotic trees in botanical, if I recall. So uh, I think the question here is, uh, can there be a, a, a stronger and tighter coordination and co collaboration between you know, uh, the LGU and uh, the academe? Uh, because we are all in the, in, in, and in the academy. So yeah, Prof Zen, and then if there are other panelists who would like to uh -huh. add. Yeah. Uh, yes, uh, Dr. Wang, thank you, Po. Um, you, currently, we are actually forging a memorandum of agreement with the DNR regional office. And uh, we have had several roundtable discussions, and uh, looking at um, the looking at how we can address these uh, problems. Pero parang nag-focus lang muna ngayon don sa Buyog Watershed, kasi nga isa lang to sa mga remaining uh, patches ng uh, forest dito sa city. And uh, in 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 that um, memorandum of agreement, kasama dyan yung mga local governments government units uh, such as yung SEPMO, uh, yung sa, sa office ni na architect Donna, and uh, yung mga barangays that are close to Buyog Watershed, like uh, yung sa Pingit and uh, yung other, other three barangays that are close to it. So we are currently on the forging of the memorandum of agreement. 
para para mga maging science based yung gagawin na uh, restoration doon sa Buyog. And also meron din kaming ongoing na proposal pa lang din ito with Camp Chenhe Management Corporation kasama rin dito ang DNR and the Academ uh, included ang UP Baguio and the Benguet State University and other stakeholders uh, para lang din makita uh, yung yung um threat ng uh, exotic species that are already found in Kamchenhe and how to properly restore it. So you, et, yan yung mga ongoing na efforts ngayon. Thank you po, uh, Ma'am Zen. How about Sir Ali, Ma'am Lisa? You want to add something po? Uh, Ma'am Rosel? Yes po, Sir Ali. Well, sa akin lang, um, so nasa, nabanggit ko rin to kanina actually nung kausap ko si, um, si Chancellor. Um, Baguio City is, a, is the home to many universities and colleges. And, but one problem is that there's really no, um, we don't talk. Okay? Kung ano man yung studies na ginawa sa UC, hindi ko alam. Okay? At the same time, uh, we also need to coordinate with um, yung local government. Okay? So, buti pa sila, Ma'am Jenny, because they, are, you know, they have this um, interaction with them. Um, I think there's an opportunity and we should take advantage of this opportunity. But at the same time, we are, gusto rin natin, syempre, open din sana yung local government and for local government to be um, accessible and to open itself to opinions from, from the academe. Yung opportunity andun palagi eh. And, kung baga yung Baguio City, ang daming assets yung Baguio City, ang daming mga professionals dito, ang daming mga academicians dito, pero hindi, tingin ko hindi masyadong natatap ng local government. So sana, sana mabuo nga eh, itong e -e consortium and a partnership with local government and academics, Baguio, Latinidad. Eh, ang tingin ko marami may tutulong to sa ating ano, eh, issues of sustainability and resilience. Thank you po, Sir Ali. Uh, uh, Ma'am Ma Risa. Uh, yes, uh, thank you. Uh, maybe I uh, I can add doon sa contribution natin as an academic institution, no? Uh, dahil uh, we've, we've been uh, working with BCHSO uh, regarding the, the COVID-19. Now, we have extended our uh, services naman Sa, sa health service din uh, regarding the dengue cases. So ngayon meron na rin kaming monitoring of the dengue cases and we actually submit the, the analysis to our tung OPA. No? So they, they also post the, the map no? uh, aside from the, the COVID-19 maps, meron na rin tayong dengue. And today, I'm actually coordinating with uh, DOH and may mga Baguio City doctors regarding yung effect naman ng, ng smoking for the non-smokers. Okay, so we are having a project regarding the effect of, uh, uh, of uh, smoking to the non-smokers in this uh, private in public establishments like the big restaurants and the other establishments. So sana ma, we will continue to contribute to the, the uh, to, a, to a better or healthier Baguio City. Thank you. Paul. Thank you, Ma'am Risa. And I think that is uh, the goal of the collaboration or partnership with higher education uh, institution that our contribution to uh, the scientific community would be translated into policies. Okay, policies that are uh, important for, uh, for the citizens of Baguio and the general public. Uh, Ma'am Roselle, you're going to say something. Okay. okay, I just want to read before we read the last question for this uh, panel session. So uh, earlier, uh, there is a question about 
uh, policies, environmental policies. And Ma'am Bawanan uh, posted in the chat box, Section 15, Article 2, the state shall protect and promote the health of the people and instill health consciousness among them. Also in Section 16, Article 2, the state shall protect and advance the right of the people to a balanced and healthful ecology in accord with the rhythm and harmony of nature. This is from the Constitution of the Republic of the Philippines, 1987. And also uh, Article 5 of the Ordinance here in Baguio City, numbered 18, series of 2016, otherwise known as the Environmental Code of Baguio City, undertakes to protect and safeguard land, including land with environmental significance. So I think uh, we'll proceed to the last question. Po. I think this is addressed to Sir Ali. Are there studies done on the wastewater situation in Baguio, given the rise in population and residences that are not connected to the sewage system? Instead, the wastewater is directed to the creeks and waterways. Sir Ali, are there studies done on the wastewater situation in Baguio, given the rise in population and residences that are not connected to the sewage system? Instead, the wastewater is directed to creeks and other waterways. Um, Ma'am Banji uh, from Ma'am Rampo. Hi, Banji. Actually, di ako aware kung merong, parang napaka-limited nga ng ano eh. I am not aware kung may mga um, studies. Um, again, I think um, the city government should really consider yung ano, um, constructing more wastewater treatment plants, pero I'm not aware of their updated studies on this. Okay, well, thank you very much, Po. And yeah, that's the end of uh, this uh, session, morning session. But let me just remind our attend uh, attendees and participants to uh, answer the evaluation form so that uh, if you need an e certificate, you can uh, get one. Uh, especially if you accomplish the evaluation form uh, that can be accessed uh, sa ating link na ipopost ng ating uh, yeah, polling here. So please fill out this evaluation form. And at the same time, uh, we are going to award the certificates to our uh, speakers this morning. So first, uh, let me just uh, read the... Yeah, the certificate, 113th Baguio Char Charter Day Anniversary Lecture. The certificate of appreciation is hereby awarded to uh, Dr. Alejandro Ciencia for sharing invaluable findings and insights from the research work during the 113th celebration of Baguio Charter Day held jointly by the College of Social Sciences and College of Science on the 9th September 2022 virtually, signed by the chairperson of the CSS Lecture Series, Professor Jose Matthew Luga, and the Dean of the College of the Social Sciences, Dr. Dean Le uh, Dr. Uh, Lea Abaya. So Thank you. this is awarded to Dr. Ali Asiencia. Next is uh, to Dr. Rosel Balmores Paulino. Okay, let's give them a virtual clap. And also Dr. Rizabel C. Adawe. And last but not the least, Dr. Zenaida G. Bawanan. So thank you very much for uh, Sir Ali, Ma'am Roselle, Ma'am uh, Riza, and Ma'am Zen for contributing uh, significantly and substantially to our uh, topics this morning. So before we leave Po, we will be having, uh, just a reminder, we will be having our next set of speakers this afternoon, uh, more on uh, Baguio as a creative uh, city. So we have uh, Ma'am Vernalisa Bautista, uh, Professor Aris Reginaldo, and also architect uh, Donna Tabangin, who will be uh, talking about this, uh, their lectures on creative, uh, creative and heritage city, rather. So before we end, po, uh, may I just want all the participants and also our uh, panelists and hosts to uh, open your, your camera so that we will be having our uh, photo opportunity. Uh, uh, this will be a memento for us to remember that we have this event, okay? Uh, and we participated in the 113th uh, charter anniversary of Baguio City. 
So, sir, who would, Sir Matthew, who will take the picture po? I'll, I'll do it na, Sir Joel. Okay, so, thank you so much for opening your cameras po. So, uh, please look at the screen. One, two. Okay, let me just say peace at my device. Perhaps one more, just to make sure that we got everyone. Okay, one, two. Okay, thank you very much for seeing you in the afternoon. Thank you all. So thank you very much, Sir Matt, and also to our speakers and also to our attendees and participants. Uh, again, we remind you to come again this afternoon and uh, join us as we continue this discussion on Baguio City as a heritage and creative uh, city. So you may now leave the Zoom meeting po. Maraming salamat. Happy lunch and Bye. see you again uh, later. Thank you very much. Or perhaps the others po who, can, who, are, who will still join the afternoon session, they can just stay at the Zoom. We'll just use the same link naman po. But for those who cannot join the afternoon, we, we, we appreciate you having joined us this morning. For the Facebook poll, there will be a separate link for the afternoon session. Thank you.